verses 1 through 11 and the 16th verse. John 15, 1 through 11 and the 16th verse. We already know what radical is. It is a, it radical is a major change or an epic action, a grandioso. It's going to be splendid. Uh, we're going to look at call real quick. It's a classification or an identity. When you receive a phone call, you receive new information. When God puts a phone call or a call out on your life, it is responsibility and information. See, when you receive information, now you have to do something about it or with it. Now you have to do something about it or with it. We know what service is. Service is to be a help, to be an assistance, to be a benefit. Service is help, assistance, or benefit. And we know what the opposite of that is. And we've said this for the past few weeks that you know if your life is a service or a benefit. You know if you are cooperating, cooperating, that means you are working with God, working hand in hand with him, and you're not getting in his way. You are willing and submissive and obedient to his purpose. Uh, we briefly dealt with the father being the vine dresser. We are going to go, we're going to move on, but let's read our key text. Our key text. We're coming from John 15, verses 1 through 11, and verse 16. John 15, 1 through 11, and verse 16. The Word of God, I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. Whatever version you have, it's okay, as long as it is, is the Holy Word of God. Amen? The Bible says this, it says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser, the cultivator, or the gardener. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. He says, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. He says, abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. He says, neither can you unless you abide in me. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And then he goes on to say, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, 
and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and I abide or stay or remain in his love. Verse 11, these things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let's move down to verse 16. Jesus makes this very clear statement emphatically says this, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide or remain, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. The radical call of God to ministry or service. We know what ministry is. Ministry is the, the inconvenience and vence, excuse me, it is the inconvenience of ourselves for the convenience of another. And I thought about this. If your perspective is right and you realize that you are here to serve God's purpose, it is not an inconvenience. It may seem to others as an inconvenience, but when your priorities are right, and you see things right, it is not an inconvenience to serve the Almighty God. So it is putting ourselves aside so that we can serve God's purpose. It's not thinking of ourselves less, but Dr. Wiersbe says it is thinking of ourselves, uh, actually not thinking of ourselves at all. You don't have to worry about your well-being. You focus on God and doing his work. God's got you covered. Matter of fact, God has some people that will look after you. You focus on God. So ministry, service. We're going to deal with that. We dealt with the pruning, the pruning process, the cutting that the Father does, and, and, and the chopping that the Father does. Uh, we mentioned that fruitless, fruitful branches are pruned for more productivity. God is not satisfied with us doing well when we can do even better. Uh, and we have students in school that, that just easily get on the honor roll without trying. God says, I, I want to push you to your maximum capacity. If you're, you, Some people can just look at the test and, and just take the test and just pass with flying colors. God says, no, I've got to stretch you. So he says, you've got to be flexible. And then he says, you've got to be firm, firm on your reliance of me and flexible because we're going to go training today. And when I train you, it's going to stretch you for more territory, more opportunity. Uh, 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 let me tell you this. If you want to do more, then pre -prepare, be prepared for God to do more uh, training in your life, more development in your life, training, chopping, pruning. Chiseling does not feel good. But at the end of the day, the end game is what we're looking at. So we dealt with his pruning. Fruitful branches are pruned. All bad spots are pruned. Useless buds are pruned. Misdirected shoots are pruned. Discolored leaves are pruned. Even fruitful believers have spots. This is a process of progress. Are you with me? Process of progress. Believers have areas that need to be cleaned, trimmed, pruned, cut out, such as areas of our thinking, our attitudes. And I said last week, I'm not the only one that cops an attitude. Uh, I'm going to leave that alone. We need this area dealt with our commitment, our passions, our motives, our behaviors, our relationships, our service, and our willingness. You know, some of our biggest issues, one of our biggest issues, and probably it is our stubbornness. We, 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 we just got to be forced. We've got to be 
Our back's got to be against the wall. Just give in. Just willingly allow God to guide you with his eye. He doesn't want to get forceful with you. He wants you to say, he wants to say, uh, can you do this? And he wants your response to be, Lord, hear my, send me, I'll go. Can you say that in your bedroom, in your car, at your laptop? Say, Lord, send me, I'll go. Because I realize that you don't have to use me. Matter of fact, you didn't have to save me. You didn't have to change me. You didn't have to pour into me. So it's just a privilege and an honor and a blessing to be able to serve you and your purposes. So there are areas that we need God. We need God and only God can do it. Let me say something. You can try to change your attitude and your behavior and, and move and maneuver. And what we do, thank you, Lord, we move things around. But God said, I don't want you to move trash from the bedroom into the garage. Because when you move from that house, the same trash that you move from the bedroom, you've got to move it from the garage. And then you move it from the garage and put it in the car. Now you got to go to the, to the trash can. He said, no, we want to get rid of that stuff. You can't hold on to that stuff because it's not allowing you to grow or breathe. Are you with me? Now, how does the father go about implementing this pruning, uh, this pressure, this cutting, chipping, shaping, and chiseling process. Uh, I, I believe part of the Bible, he does it two different ways. Two different ways. He implements this pruning process, and I'm going to throw this at you. And I, I, I was, as I was preparing, I kept hearing that the pruning process is the healing process. I kept hearing it in my spirit. And so I said, let me go ahead and write that down. There are two ways the father, who is the gardener, implements the pruning process, which is the healing process. Listen, it's kind of hard working on a patient that is bleeding when you are bleeding. And my wife told me that hurt people hurt people. So the pruning process is hurtful, but it's the healing process so you can go out and get someone else free. I said a lot right there. First of all, he implements this pruning process, which is the healing process, through the scripture, through the word of God. John 17, 17 through 19, from the NLT, says, make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I am sending them into the world and I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so that they can be made holy by your truth. The second way, the second way that the Father, and let me, let me, let me give you another scripture on uh, 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 the healing or pruning process done by the truth. James 1, 22 through 24. I'm going to say something about this passage of scripture. It says this in James 1, 22 through 24. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. You are self-deceived. I would rather somebody else deceive me for me to, than for me to deceive myself. And then he goes on in verse 23. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself and you walk away and forget what you look like. So the first way is the truth that transforms or the scriptures. That's how he implements his process of pruning, which is the healing process. Now, we just said the word of God is a mirror. I've got to make a point here. God's word is a mirror for personal use. It is like the cosmetic mirror that the women use sometimes when they're on the road driving. I've seen them do it. They got this little mirror in their face or the visor that they let down. It, listen, God's word is a mirror for personal use. Personal use. To look at for what? Reflection. To look at for what? Direction. To look at for what? And correction. It is not a telescope or a pair of binoculars. Ah! To look intently into the flaws, mistakes, and issues of others. Neither, it, it, neither is it a 
status quo, to hear my heartbeat, to gauge my heart posture. Focus on yourself. Look at yourself. Look inwardly. And if you can stand to look in the mirror and don't be a forgetful hearer, that truth, that scripture will transform. You're not a, don't pull out the telescope or the binoculars or the status quo. The second way he implements this pruning process is through suffering, through the scripture and through suffering. James 1, 2 through 4, I've got to read this. It says, dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. I, I'm, we're dealing with all kind of trouble today, today, COVID-19, today. Today, today, it's all kind of stuff we're dealing with today. So the Lord says, stop looking at this the wrong way. This is an opportunity, an opportunity for great joy, civil unrest, governmental issues. He says, this is the great opportunity for me to get glory. You can benefit from this if you would change your perspective. And then he says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. You start off walking a mile, then you get a month, two months, and then you kick the mile up to two miles. And you may drop back down, but as you continue to go on, you went from two miles to three miles to four miles. Now you're running. You're jogging, then you're running. So he said, it's an opportunity for you to for you to be stretched, for you to be uh, 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 pulled out of your comfort zone. Nobody's comfortable in COVID-19. Nobody's comfortable in civil unrest. Nobody. We've all been affected either directly or indirectly. All of our finances have been affected. But the Lord said, according to the Apostle James, this is an opportunity. God is cutting God is pruning, God is shaping, God is doing something great through the suffering. Look at it from the proper perspective. He told Paul, no, I can't change what's going on in your life. But what I will do is apply my grace. Grace, grace. And if I get the opportunity, I'm going to teach a series on grace changes everything. He says, my grace is sufficient. My grace, my strength is made perfect when you realize I've allowed COVID-19 to be a situation you can't just figure it out. Trouble is an opportunity to grow. <laughs> and that's what he's saying. And then Hebrews 12 and 11, it is never fun to be corrected. In fact, at the time, it is always painful. It doesn't feel good when you're getting trimmed on, pushed back, held back. But he says, I'm holding you back. To push you forward. I'm, I'm letting you stay stuck. Matter of fact, I'm letting people walk all over you. My mother says this. You can walk on my shoes because I just walk on the bottom of them. Let people defraud you. Let people disrespect you. The Bible says the Lord will fight for you. This is an opportunity for you to grow. For you to advance. For you to increase. Listen, if there is no weight on the weights. You are not exerting. It doesn't take force. It takes pressure. It takes pressure of problems, pressure of issues, pressure of setbacks. Listen, and with the pressure, it causes something in you, the God in you, to apply force and to push up on it. And I love, I hear it. The Holy Spirit is our spotter. When the pressure of life come and weigh us down, something in me, the God in me says, push up, Marlon. Push up, Monique, and then I say, Lord, I'm pushing, I'm trying, God, but the Spirit of God steps in, and, he, and all he has to do is tap the bar, and, and the more he taps the bar, I, I get a, more, a little more strength, and, and, and then I hear the crowd, sometimes the crowd is good, because the crowd says, if you win, I can win. So the Spirit of God, he, he, he taps. And you know who the crowd of is the great witnesses that went on that I can think about, about John the Baptist and, and about Paul and about Peter. That's my crowd of witnesses. They made it with the same recipe that it takes for me to make. I've got God. I've got God. I've got the Spirit of the living God. I've got the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So that's how he does it. Listen to this. Hebrews 5 and 8 says, although that the Lord Jesus was a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. Listen, 
I got to say this and we're going to move on. Without fruit in the believer's life, there is no evidence of true, genuine Christianity. I don't care if your leaves are green. What's the fruit? <laughs> Listen, we need more than just a green leaf. It's a lot of stuff that a lot of plants have green leaves. Weeds have green leaves. Artificial plants on tables have green leaves. Some folks have roses with green leaves tattooed on their bodies. But Jesus says in Luke 6, 43 through 45, that a fruit is known. Listen, the quality and the species is known by the fruit that it bears, by the bloom that comes out. You can't detect it because a lot of plants have the same type of pattern as a green leaf. But when the fruit comes out, and the fruit, I'm saying something, I'm going somewhere, is a depiction of what is connected to who is the vine. Whatever you're connected to, you display. Whatever you talk about, or think about rather, you speak on it. I'm going to go on. God's goal for every Christian is to increase in fruit bearing. We see there's uh, stages, <clears throat> excuse me, to this thing. We go from no fruit to some fruit to more fruit to much fruit. And then we go to where our fruit, we just get some hang time. Uh, does your fruit hang on? Do you have hang time? Is what Jesus doing in you lasting for more than a week, more than a day, more than a millisecond? <laughs> Listen, fruit has three characteristics. First, it reflects the character of its tree. Second, fruit is visible. I, if I can't see you, I don't know. I don't know what kind of tree you are. I don't know if I want any help from you or if I want to benefit from, from benefit from you. Third, fruit is always for the benefit of others. If you are always serving yourself instead of others, your fruit is going to rot on a tree. Uh, and I think I just said something. Look about, think about somebody else. Help somebody else. Now we saw in verse 2 that the, that the father is the gardener and cultivator. But I want to show you a different side of the father's role. Not only is the father, as we see in this passage, the gardener or cultivator, he is the owner. He is the owner. He is not a day laborer. It cost him the brutal death of his only unique son. It hurt the father to bruise him. It hurt the father to crush him. It hurt the father to pierce him. But because he was driven by his own divine purposes to save humanity, he got joy when he looked at the end game. The son got joy when he looked at the end game. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 20. For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver, which lose their value. <laughs> It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless lamb of God. God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake, the precious, spotless blood of the lamb. When someone depletes their all for what they have purchased, or invested in. They pour all of them into their interests, all of their time, all of their mind, all of their efforts, literally all of them. They are totally invested. Listen, beloved, listen, friends. The vine and the branch are to be one. I'm going somewhere. Jesus said, Father, in John 17, make them one as we are one. And because we are connected in Christ the Son, we get all the benefits of the Son. You hear me? The protection the Son gives. Every prayer prayed is answered through the Son. The Bible says in Romans 8, 14 that we are heirs of God and joint heirs 
with the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's move on to verse 3. Verse 3 says, you, he says in the ESV, already you are clean. It should say you are clean already because of the word that I have spoken to you. Listen, in this passage, we are dealing with true born again believers. John speaks to this in John 13, 10 through 11. Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you, for Jesus knew who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean, referring to Judas. Now listen, we are saved by grace alone. He says, you are already clean because of what I said. I called you. I am saving you. I am rescuing you because I spoke it. He sent his word and it will accomplish. So listen, we are saved by grace alone. That's sola gratia. Through faith alone. That's sola fide. In Christ alone. That's solas Christus. Because of God alone, that's solely Deo, who gets all the glory alone. Solely Deo Gloria. Salvation is the plan of God, energized by the power of God for the purposes of God. I said salvation is the plan of God, energized by the power of God for the purpose of God. Sola de Gloria. Listen, the song says, all the glory belongs to you. He, listen, he paid the price with the precious, precious blood of the, of the Lamb of God. With, and it says, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Listen, you can, you can start over today, brand new today. Forget your past. Your past is over. I'm going somewhere. I, I, I'm going to move today. Listen. Then he goes on to say in the fourth verse, abide in me. Now in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus says this. Listen to me. This is important. Catch this. Jesus says abide in me. The word is me. No, it's a command with a promise. He says you abide in me and I guarantee I'll abide in you. Jesus says remain in me. Don't go anywhere. Let's have Koronia. Let's fellowship. He says, fellowship with me. I want us to be close. This is Jesus' love language to you. He said, this is my love language. Listen, he said, let's be on the same page. He says, share with me. Be in partnership with me. What's mine is yours and what's yours is mine. Let's do life together. He said, I want to have a life group with you. Oh, let's do life together. He says, we are a power team. Listen, he says, we are a power couple. Let's build together. He says, stay here. I will satisfy you. I will keep you in perfect peace. I will love you completely forever. I will love you completely forever. I will break the chains in your life. I will give you a fresh start. He says, I will give you a jump start because it's from grace to grace on top of grace. Matter of fact, he says, it's grace multiplied. Grace changes everything. He says, I'm all that you will ever need. Remain here. Don't run away. I've, I've, got, it. I've got you covered. I love you. I can't stop thinking about you. I've got you on my mind. That's what he means by staying here. Remain. He says, I'm your present and your future, so leave your past behind. I'm your new beginning. We can start over every day. I feel like when I'm your new beginning, I need a fresh start of brand new mercies every day. Listen, should I falter, should I fall, I'll be handled and captured in your grace. In your grace. He says, I have a purpose for you. I am your passion. I am your dunamis. I am your skill and will. Power to keep you going. I will make you effective and impressive. Listen. He says, I need you. That's what Jesus said. I need you. You need me. We're one. We're one. And then he, Isaiah 53, 53 and 2 from the King James says that Jesus is the root out of dry ground. Everything could be going awry around us right now like it's going today. My wife, listen, is not able to occupy in her business. Things are going awry. Listen, resources are running out. 
Tragedy seems to be triumphing. Businesses are going bankrupt. Sicknesses are soaring at an alarming rate. The prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 8.22 from the Good News Translation says, Is there no medicine in Gilead? Are there no doctors there? Why then have my people not been healed? But I submit to you today, there is a bomb in Gilead. There's some medicine for your soul. There's some medicine for your mind. I hear the scripture. The Lord said, I send my medicine in my word. If you would get in my word and lock into my word, meditate on my word, you'll be stable like a tree. You'll be planted. Listen, you won't have to say shake like a leaving tree. Listen, the winds will come and shake you. You will move around, but you will be steadfast because you are established on the rock. The rock is Jesus. Based on his word, he said, I will build my church. And I don't care even if the devil, the very gates, he said, you won't be shaken because, listen, because you're anchored. Though the storms are raging in my life and though the billows come, my soul is anchored. It's a, and it grips a solid rock. I hear you. I hear my cousin right now in my ear, Elder Kevin Bell. He, 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 he says, on Christ, the solid rock, I say, stand. All the grounds are seeking sand. Then I hear, build your hopes on things eternal. Yeah, are you with me? I wish we could go further. I wish we had more time. And so because things are bad, there is a bomb in Gilead. And I've got to read this one more scripture. We're done for today. But because we are in the true vine, we can say like Habakkuk in Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. I've got to read this. He says, though the fig tree does not blossom. I feel, I feel, I feel, like, I feel like running. I feel like weeping in your presence, but I'm going to try to hold my composure. And there is no fruit on the vines. Though the yield of the olives fails, and the fields produce no food, they said the money is running out. That's what they said. There's no coins <laughs> in the system. Though the flock is cut off, they said they're raising the price of meat because they're not producing like they should. And though the fold and there are no cattle in the stalls, Habakkuk said, yet I will choose to rejoice in the Lord. I will choose to shout in exultation in the victorious God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, my source of courage, my invincible army. He has made my feet steady and sure like the deer or the hind feet and makes me walk forward with spiritual confidence and all my high places of challenge and responsibility for the choir director, all my stringed instruments. We'll leave off with this. Isaiah 40, 28 to 31 says, they that wait on the Lord, in the Lord, connected to the Lord, it has been a blessing. And we count it as a privilege to be in your homes on the day. We love you. We're praying for you. We pray that something was said that would change your whole life's curricula, the whole order, the whole trajectory, the whole direction of your life. We love you. We are praying for you. And if anything, if we can do anything to be assistance, whether it be feed, pray, or counsel, or just walk with you, we are here for you. Your problem is no problem to us because your problem is no problem to God. We are a church that's driven by the word of God for the purposes of God. You, I can be reached at area code 951-522-2125. If you feel led to be a blessing to this ministry, you can do so via Cash App, which is the dollar sign Church Beyond Walls. That's W-A-L-L-S, Church Beyond Walls, or Venmo, at Church Beyond Walls. We love you, we are praying for you, and we look forward to seeing you again at the same time at possibly a different place. God bless you. We'll see you again.
two fingers. The Lord is good.